call. And uh, next up is Matthew Eric Pump. He is an eight-year organizer with the Committee for the Republic of Canada. He is speaking to us from Montreal. Uh, so you will actually, this is his presentation. Uh, let me bring him up here. Hello, can I be heard? Yes, I apologize, there is a bit of buzzing. We'll have to put up with that for the moment. Um, so Matt is an eight-year organizer with the Committee for the Republic of Canada, and he is a, uh, the founding editor of the Canadian Patriot Review. Valuable, valuable research that has been done on the history of Canada and our role in the, the global strategic situation. Um, they're all in the back there. I encourage you to, to have a look and uh, purchase them if you can. Um, so Matt's going to uh, give us a discussion now on... Um, how about you tell? How about you tell the audience what you're going to talk about? Okay. Well, uh, thank you for inviting me to give a, a summary report um, at your conference, Robbie. Um, so, um, what I want to get across with this cartoon that I just began with that says "Stop, stop the Wall Street Euro time bomb with a global glass steagall." Um, is important because this, this image really does illustrate the the essence of the battle that we don't have an economy right now. What people think of as an economy of a euro, of uh, a dollar, is actually more uh, to be compared with a bomb. And when you look at what's holding this thing together and the global speculative markets, what is sustaining and keeping some seeming stability in the system is really a mountain of unpayable debts, which at this point is ripe uh, to default, to go bust, and take this pyramid scheme down with it. So we're sitting on a bubble. It's a bubble that, by its nature, will pop. And LaRouche, um, the American economist whom we, whom we work with, has made the point over decades, on record, that this could be understood. This is something which doesn't have to catch anybody off guard as a surprise. This is something which was foreseeable, which our movement has been created by Mr. LaRouche 40 plus years ago to stop from happening, based on the fact that there are certain principled variables shaping uh, social processes in the universe that are not purely mathematical, statistical, or monetary. The fact that most economists who try to predict the future and fail, and act every time as if it's a surprise that there's another economic crisis, fail because they are not taking into consideration those basic principles of reality, which Paul uh, illustrated that were more understood before the Bretton Woods system was, uh, or the, the fixed exchange rate system of the Bretton Woods was floated in 1971. In saner periods in Canada, the United States, and the Western world, and the world at large, we had a better sense of this. Now that's, that's generally gone. So by getting across, um, what, well, basically by getting across the fact that everybody has the ability to know the future and to change it by being rigorous, rigorous of mind and moral, um, we can understand how to stop this hyperinflationary bubble from, from blowing up. And for anybody who doesn't know what hyperinflation is, uh, Robbie, the next picture uh, gets across an image from Germany in 1923, when you had a certain uh, process which ripped across the German, uh, at the time it was a republic, based upon the belief that the Versailles debt trees were somehow payable by an act of money printing. Now, this is the only comparable uh, process in modern times to what we face today, in the sense that we are facing a similar type of insanity, the idea that debt, because it is debt, must be paid, even if it means just printing money uh, and shutting down costly social processes like hospitals and other, other forms of infrastructure. Uh, this insanity, which led to the, the destruction of the German uh, Reichsmark, which you see being burnt there in a fire, because really, it, it, that was what the you know, German currency's value was, was kindling. It was worth more than wood, because wood was harder to find than the trillions and trillions of dollars of paper, which lost all of its value. Today's hyperinflation is global. It's much bigger, and as they say, the higher you are, the harder you fall. We've got seven billion people. At the time, it was isolated into Germany, into a certain geographical region. Um, but the principle of its uh, avoidance is the same. Now, today's uh, situation looks a little bit more like the second graph. Uh, Robbie, if you can go to the second image. 
Okay. This is an image, no, back up one. Yep. So today's hyperinflationary bubble, of which the Canadian economy is locked into, and make no mistake about it, our banking system, as I will show in a few graphs later on, is highly integrated in this global bubble. Um, this is ready to blow. This is Everything that you see in red represents the growth of something which didn't even exist before the 1980s called derivatives. Now, I don't have enough time to go into really what that is. A lot's been written on this. But effectively, what we're dealing with are fictitious speculative capital based on different types. And there's trillions of different types of derivatives that deal with uh, speculating on insured uh, debts, on varieties of um, credit default swaps. The mortgage-backed security debacle was an example of this. Um, but you don't just see the red increasing to the point of almost $2 trillion, which are um, current estimates of the quantity of what's in the system now. Um, minimally, you have between 700 trillion to 2 quadrillion, which is on the board, many more times than the world GDP. But in blue and in yellow, uh, blue and in green, you should also see stocks and debt. Now, the stocks and debt themselves are a little bit more closely linked in general to the physical economy, the actual productive, you know, components of the economy, which is generally, generally, not always, and in this case, less and less today, but generally tied to something you could trace back to something which was created, uh, moved, purchased. Um, that, as you can see, is completely overshadowed things that are tied to something that is a little bit more based in reality. Now, in the case of 1923 Germany, the political component of this is that the even though there was a seeming respite by printing the money uh, for a few months uh, to pay off these Versailles treaties uh, that Germany was imposed by Britain and by their, their, their Wall Street lackeys after World War I, by printing this, there was a momentary respite. However, what became realized is that that collapse of the economy resulted in a multi-year shock therapy to the population, which resulted in such a mass psychological trauma that any form of security and stability that could be offered to provide some bread uh, once again to the population was accepted, which formerly would have been considered morally reprehensible. Um, this took on the form of what you can imagine as Adolf Hitler and Nazism. In, uh, in Italy, this form took on a different one in the form of Mussolini. In America, you had something similar uh, that was taking form in a massive a fascist movement sponsored again by, by the enemies of the American Constitution in Wall Street uh, and London in the form of, well, many, many enemies who would try very hard to kill and overthrow Franklin Delano Roosevelt. However, luckily for the world at that time, Franklin Roosevelt was the only uh, leader of, of the Western world who rejected fascism as a solution to the economic uh, crises that basically dominated the Western world throughout the 20s in the United States and in Canada, of course, which spread to Europe later on, was the Great Depression. Now, Roosevelt understood the nature of this beast, and for those in Canada who say, oh, but Glass-Steagall is a, it's not Canadian, it's an American legislation, they betray it, that, that statement, which you will frequently uh, come across, betrays a very big ignorance of the process that we are, are all a part of. Because not only did you have Glass-Steagall legislation uh, implemented in Europe uh, to separate speculative banking activities from regular, clean commercial banking activities that were essential for the functioning of your society. But in Canada as well, this was one of the, the foundations of the Canadian uh, reconstruction in the, throughout the 40s, 50s, and into the 60s of all of our infrastructure uh, and science technology, which has sadly come largely undone. Um, now, Roosevelt was dealing with the Spanish element inside of America, as Canada was as well in the early 30s here too, where we had the League of Social Reconstruction, which was being pushed by uh, proponents of the eugenics Nazi ideology, who wished to have a type of technocratic, Malthusian, uh, fascist regime type of government in Canada as their solution to the, the Great Depression. Now, Roosevelt understood this process. He understood that the bankers in Wall Street had created the Great Depression, which didn't need to happen. That bubble that popped then was due largely 
and Roosevelt made it his point in the first 100 days in office to correct this, but it was made, it was created, this bubble, because of the ability for banks, speculative banks, to access people's deposits and then put it into highly risky speculative ventures that created a lot of momentary returns for investors, but created giant bubbles, especially in housing, which all proceeded to collapse on what was called Black Tuesday, when the broker columns were called in and the bubble was popped. Now, Roosevelt understood this nature of this thing, and so working with a senator and a congressman named, well, Senator Glass and Congressman Stegall, you had the creation of this bill, which was based on breaking up the banks and ensuring that any bank which speculated and took a loss would not get protected by national government. There would be no such thing as a bailout. There would be no such thing as a two-week-to-fail. And any bank which was a part of the vital component of the national health, of the general welfare, that was protected by government insurance, nothing else but that. And banks would not have the ability to access easy money from pensioners, from savings or other parts of the real economy. So to the degree that that wall was kept in place, we had real growth. And under the Bretton Woods system of fixed exchange rates, the principle of monetary principle, the belief in monetarism as a driver of value and of personal vice was kept in a controlled little bubble that was not able to dominate the decision-making and large-scale economic planning of where your nation was going. So this was the process that brought us into a world of potential throughout the 60s with the opening up of the space age, the opening up of the atomic age, and the idea was the end of colonialism. It was not simply an economic or some utopian view that, oh, now we would have an age of Eden on the earth where science technology would save us. No. The understanding by John F. Kennedy, people who you will hear later on in this conference about, even in Canada, was that it was through uplifting the intellectual qualities of the population in both our own countries as well as in third world former colonized nations in South America, Asia, Africa, that we would be able to finally end the imperial system and embark upon an age of peaceful coexistence based on exploring the universe and exploring our understanding of vision, fusion, and the mastery of the forces of nature for the benefit of human beings. So this is what we once had. Now this will be brought up once again in the coming panel, but to bring this back to Canada, why do we need Glass-Steagall? Let's move one closer. Ravi, can you go to the next graph? So just to look at this in another angle a little bit more closely from our friends in the United States, just to get a sense of the contagion, one of the estimates on the lower end is that there's about $700 trillion of derivatives, which you see on the graph to the left. In a breakdown of the biggest banks in the United States, you can see clearly that the majority of what they consider assets and what we've been bailing out since 2008 have really just been protecting their derivatives. The real economy, neither in Greece nor in the United States nor even in Canada, has received virtually any of the bailout which has kept these major institutions from collapsing. So we lost our economy in 2008. We don't have an economy anymore. We have a bailout system. This is the importance of joining the BRICS, to let the bomb go off in a contained way, taking these bankers down, but protect what's real and let these derivatives just go by reorganizing the real economy. So people say, oh, but the Canadian banks, we made it through it okay. That's the American context. Canada's banks are safe. We were responsible. Now that's completely fallacious, and this is why the mayor of Burnaby agreed with the city council to endorse our call for Glass-Steagall. This is why many union representatives have done the same by calling on our international parliamentarians' call for Glass-Steagall, which I encourage everyone here to begin to work with us on, as well as the joining of the BRICS petition as well. But if you look to the Canadian banks in the next slide, Robby, can you go to the next? What we have is basically just looking at the overall big six banks using OSPI figures. We can see that, and this is already three years ago. In fact, the derivatives exposure to the banks has increased from $20 trillion, which we see in the red bar 
to well over $25 trillion a day, possibly more. It's tough to calculate. The equity in the assets, assets being things like securitized debt, which themselves have very little real value when you look at what's holding that together, especially in the consumer debt and housing sector in Canada, that's already only $3 trillion, a relatively small fraction of the derivative exposure of our big six banks. And equity, actually seemingly more tangible things, even just a fraction of that. It's ridiculous. But if you break down the additional slide, right, what we have are the, again, an individual outline of the big six banks shows you that RBC is obviously off the hook with over $7 trillion a day. This, again, is from 2011. This is well over $7 trillion in RBC. TD, pretty bad as well. Bank of Nova Scotia, you name it, every single one of these things are completely overexposed. And if you have a default in one part of the system by either in Greece or in the United States, or there's so many trigger points that really any point will set off a chain reaction of reverse leverage. These, what people think are value today, what they think of as their pensions today, which are tied into these derivative assets, are going to become simply toilet paper tomorrow. So overall, we cannot have this holier-than-thou view, which many Canadians have been infested with, that this is an American problem, or this is a Greek problem, or a Portuguese or Spanish or Irish problem. It is not the case. It's a global problem of humanity. And again, when you look at where the bailouts have gone, in the case of Greece, people say, oh, the Greeks are lazy. They got hundreds of billions of dollars of bailout from the ECB and Troika. Why are they still in debt trouble if they couldn't use that to get themselves out of debt? Well, it's because 90% of that bailout went not at all to the Greek people or nation, but to Deutsche Bank and the other speculative banks that have been receiving trillions of dollars of bailouts from the Federal Reserve of America and the ECB, the most recent bailout having been announced and begun just this week of $1.6 trillion that's going to be flooded into the European markets. We have Japan doing this as well. This is a globally insane process that can only be stopped by introducing Glass-Steagall, which has an increasing amount of support, both within the Greek government as well as across Europe. In the Italian parliament, our friends there have introduced legislation for Glass-Steagall once again in the U.S., as well as our calls that we're organizing for in Canada. But that by itself, again, is not enough. Because at the end of the day, this is not a financial problem. Simply splitting up the banks is not adequate. What we need to do is recognize that the deeper problem is physical. It's spiritual, it's intellectual. And if you go to the last graph I threw out there, what you have underlying this debt bomb, of this speculative derivatives bomb, what you have is a collapse of the physical economy. This is what LaRouche has developed a scientific mastery of in opening up a whole new science for the first time, beginning in the 1950s, when he began making his long-term forecasts and being right on record every time. But not simply to be right, but to stop the forecasts from happening. And this is something which I encourage everyone to go onto our website, to check out the written records, and then study the method of analysis that LaRouche has been making available to policymakers internationally and have been adopted by major portions of the Russian, Chinese, and other BRICS nations' governments in their reactions to the collapse of the Western system that LaRouche has been a lone voice for for many decades in warning about. But what we have is, again, going back to the graph, if you simply look at the overall composite of the workforce, simply that simple variable of services to productive workers, what you have is a completely dramatic collapse from the point we were at after World War II, where the majority of our workers were in productive sectors, and the services were a necessary but a secondary feature of our economy to the point that we're at today, where services, and if you included financial services, this would be much higher still, represent the vast majority of the overall economy. Now, obviously, any world or any system which tries to simply consume in a consumer mode without producing, without industrial production, and increasing your free energy relative to the total energy 
overhead consumption of the system, any, anybody that tries to consume more than they produce is destined to uh, atrophy and collapse, which has been the entire 50-year uh, effect since the murder of John F. Kennedy and the abolishment of certain key development policies that we were committed to in Canada uh, that were all the way up post-World War II through C.D. Howe into Diefenbaker, uh, which were abandoned. And that will be a featured presentation uh, in the next panel. So I think with that, um, keeping in mind that the, the Glass-Steagall by itself, the National Bank by itself, are nothing if we don't also have a commitment to realign with this new paradigm that has been offered to us by the BRICS countries uh, on multiple occasions by Vladimir Putin, by Xi Jinping and others who want the West to join the AIIB as uh, <laughs> Great Britain, the mother country, uh, has expediently chosen to begin to do and which any other country can join uh, through opening up the vast Arctic resources to scientific and technological progress and much more uh, which you'll hear a lot more about. So I think with that I'll just end my presentation and uh, we can open up for a few questions with Paul. Yes, I do. Uh, just before the question, and answer Sue's question, uh, is it an appropriate time to read greetings that we were given from uh, former uh, Premier of BC, uh, Bill Vanderstam. His greetings to our conference. Uh, he says, anybody of any body of people seeking change to our political, governmental, and economic system is of great interest to me. A political and governmental system that is more influenced by the wants of top bureaucrats, the elite and their lobbyists, than by the will of the people is corrupt. An economic system that takes its direction from the Wall Street casino, bails out the too big to fail banks, other financial institutions and big business will destroy us. The world's governments are still more inclined to rely on wars than innovative mega projects like land uh, like landline connecting the continents through the Bering Strait. He meant World Land Bridge. But thanks to the efforts of organizations such as yours, this will hopefully change. Bill Van Der Zandt. I can hear you okay, yes, speak loud. It's Thomas, you might have remembered me a while back, anyhow. Um, my question is to simplify derivatives in a simple way. Would that be similar to um, say um, a person takes bets on the outcome of certain investments, uh, real estate, stocks, whatever, would you describe it being similar to that? Derivatives selling off these bets. You want me to handle that? Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, I would say there, you can sell it on a two fall if you want. Um, I would say, um, as a quick like visual image. Well, actually, you no. Know, I'll, I'll save the visual image for afterwards. Um, derivatives originally came out of a perversion of an idea of selling. Um, sort of a futures contract on, let's say, agricultural, like, let's say you don't, you, you are a farmer, you need a certain amount of uh, capital to maintain your farm's activities, uh, but your, your product will only be produced in a harvest time in many months. Um, but you don't know if it's going to go bad. You don't know if maybe there's going to be a bad harvest. So you take out an insurance um, to make sure that you can at least, if there is a bad harvest, you will be able to still make the capital to sustain your, your functions. Uh, that idea of insurance is okay, you know, in a, in a physical economy that's fine. What was increasingly done um, throughout the 80s and leading up to Alan Greenspan coming in as Federal Reserve Chairman was it was realized that we could simply get the production side, which the farmer does, out of the equation and simply start taking uh, different types of securitized debts and simply start um, ensuring whether they go good, whether they go bad, uh, whether their value as securities increases or decreases and put a value on that that you can then bet on. Um, so it increasingly uh, took on a very complex uh, type of arrangement over the years where 
almost anything became something you could ensure. Like, for example, whether the weather was going, going to be um, hotter than expected in Cuba, and in that case, the Coca-Cola shipments might have a lesser sale. Uh, people would tend to buy less Coca-Cola if it's not as hot as expected, so you can take out a weather derivative. Or if a, a ship would arrive a few minutes or a few hours late uh, at port, you can take out a time derivative. And so increasingly, the, the quantity of these types of insurances on almost anything uh, took on more value than the actual products being produced and consumed in the system, to the point that they started driving the system and taking over the system to the point that, and this is the metaphor I was going to say at the beginning, um, you could really just start imagining now uh, derivatives as a, uh, like a 40-pound tick sucking the blood of an emaciated little two-pound puppy. There's not, the two pound puppy is what we live in, that's our physical economy. Uh, so people are, are more looking at, at these financial uh, gambling bets. So you're kind of right, and I think Paul might be able to say a little bit more on that if uh, you want, Paul. Yeah, thank you. Um, Alan Greenspan is, a, is the author of the whole derivative process in the US and, and it's spread throughout the world. All of these things were illegal. Um, and what happened is that there was a financial collapse in the United States in 1987. And rather than allowing the values of the, uh, of the collapse to go to the natural level, Alan Greenspan started something called the river. Okay. And the way it works uh, is that, and Alan Greenspan understood it very well. He said, Derivatives are great, they spread the risk, but the ultimate consequence is that they create a systemic risk, meaning that the whole system goes. Rather than just one little part of, of the system goes, the whole system goes. So the idea is that um, you create, um, in a, uh, okay, you, you are at a sports stadium, and people are betting on the outcome of the Contest. Okay, now you take those bets and you actually sell them and you create a market in those. Okay, and what you're doing is you're tying up all of the, the, the financial resources in these bets. And then if it looks like your bet's going to go bad, you make another even bigger bet to counter that bet, and then another bet, and then another bet, and then another. So it's like a Ponzi scheme. It's like a huge chain letter that just keeps growing, and it keeps growing. And as long as it's growing, and as long as the whole thing doesn't collapse, then <laughs> it's still, it's still, it, now, that system essentially runs the world, because it's tying up all the credit. It's tying up all the investment. It's tying up everything. And then you make a profit, right? You're leveraging, okay, so you're leveraging a $10 bet is leveraging $1,000 worth of derivatives. If you make a minuscule change, it, it multiplies itself, and now you have a profit in the bank. But that profit was not earned in any legitimate way. So the whole system is geared towards that. And then, and then what happens is in order to keep the system alive, you have to lower the interest rates. Because all this debt has to be rolled over. If you have a high interest rate, it will blow up. So you have to lower it down. Now we're down to negative interest rates. So that's what's going on. You're down to negative interest rates, where where you're back, you're paying interest to borrow money. You, you know, they're paying you to borrow the money. Okay. So why? Because if you if you had, that's why the interest rates go so low. But if the interest rates go so low, you can't make any, uh, you can't get any return on your savings. So what do you do? You give it to the you give it to the hedge fund to put into the derivatives. So the whole thing just keeps going like this, and it becomes. It becomes incredible, and then finally, when the crisis occurs, all the governments of the world have to come in and bail it out because otherwise, the whole thing's going to go. And that's what they told people in 2008 in the United States: "Hey, we'll be tanks in the streets if you don't if you don't cough up." So, because the whole system will go. So that's the kind of insanity that you're dealing with, and that system is finished, and they're trying to keep it afloat, and and uh, <laughs> you know, but uh, but Alan Greenspan was accurate. He said, eventually there'll be a systemic collapse. <laughs> so he knew, he knew what he was talking about. So I don't know if that Any other clarifies questions? it. Go ahead. Um, just what you just said about transitioning
to a, or so, so this system collapsing and transitioning. What I have not understood is who, how, how does that happen? So the people that have the money, do they keep their money and just, okay, now we're in bricks? Like, what, what happens through that transition and what happens specifically to, okay. let's call them the, 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 the trend In the transition, all this bad paper gets wiped out, period. All these derivatives get wiped out. All the stuff that's not worth anything gets wiped out. That's what you want. But that all, but you want to do that without, without collapsing society. If you can do that without collapsing society, then you can start with, then you can start building, then you can start developing. Do the rich lose their money? In the uh, if people have it, yeah. People, are, well, it's not. They, a lot of people think they have money in the stock market. Well, some of that, they might, that might be good. But if their money's all tied up in the in, in the casino. And there's no more casino, and the whole thing collapses. Well, yeah, they're going to lose, but they never had it to begin with. In another way, it's like saying if the pension fund, if the government pension fund, right. or the teachers' pension fund has a lot of these assets called derivatives, and the derivative market collapses, you're not getting a pension. Ha! Huh. But the government can come in and protect the people that are being hurt by this. But will they? Will they have to? That's the whole point. Go ahead. Oh, well, will that, probably stupid to ask, but will that include gold and silver? All this bad paper gets wiped out. Be gone. All this derivatives get wiped out. All right. Um, okay. Can she repeat that? Again? The issue of gold and silver, right? Yeah. Gold and silver certificates oh. in um, any bank, like whatever bank. There's, not real. there's only, there's only, there's only one thing. I, I yeah. didn't tell you. No, I'm asking the question because I think I already know the answer. Right. Uh, which is, it's just as the toilet paper, which was mentioned by Matthew, because yeah. it, if someone says they have, they can, pay, they gonna, this certificate will guarantee you gold. Uh, Precisely. You're going on their on, on their word, okay? Thank you. I okay. <laughs> you're going on their word, okay? <laughs> All right. Yeah. I, I, can I throw in one uh, one quick item? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, I would just say as well that there is a race uh, against time right now where there is two ways of uh, doing a transition to a new system. And one way is highly preferable, which is the one that we're all talking about towards uh, adopting this BRICS paradigm, which obviously begins with Glass-Steagall. But this is, it's important to be aware that uh, the other way is through the bail-in. Um, there's, there's the battle between whether it's the private financial interests that succeed in declaring nations bankrupt, and increasingly they've been doing this by putting their private uh, losses onto the public shoulders and declaring it, you know, the basis of massive killer austerity. Um, this, and then that, at a certain point, just simply saying that, okay, nations are bankrupt, bail-ins uh, would be the trigger to begin to massively seize accounts and trigger a global, uh, you know, run on the banks type of thing, which is what triggered the Great Depression. Um, the oligarchy cannot do that because of what the BRICS have done. Because at this point, if the BRICS are in a state of development, it is understood right now that this new system, which has all of the, the framework now set in place with the correct paradigm of long-term uh, future potential, which was what Narendra Modi has described as the basis of the BRICS, um, that will become the globally hegemonic system, without a doubt. So, the oligarchy is not capable of acting upon the bail-in regime, which currently, again, uh, it is set up to uh, confiscate massive amounts of savings, pensions, deposits, in a coordinatedly global way, and trigger the blowout. And so, really, to keep in mind that it's not like time is necessarily on our side, but we do need to be aware that it's going to be a new system one way or the other. It's just that right now, um, it would be a thermonuclear war that gets in the way and everybody gets wiped out. So the oligarchy is acting on a, on a utopian view of a world that cannot come into being. Humanity doesn't work that way because they're treating us like animals or programmable robots, which we're not, uh, but they would like us to be that way in their fantasy world. So their utopian view is going to destroy them too. So Glass-Steagall is the only way uh, really at this point. The mechanisms uh, can be sorted out, 
but you got to do blast debuild. And the brick system is the only functional paradigm right now which the oligarchy is not able to control and is based on a real a moral principle that humanity actually represents as a creative being in the universe, right? So we have to keep, keep our minds focused on, on the political realities too. And I'll just add one thing. In Greece, the leadership of Greece is saying, we're not paying this debt if it's destroying, it's, it's going to destroy our people. The people, the general welfare comes first. And that's going to decide what kind of what kind of arrangements we're going to make be made. And that has to be true for every nation. The general welfare of the nation and its people come first. The, the, these guys come last. You know, and, that, and that's that's what's being established as a principle right now in, in the Greek in the Greek crisis. I think uh, that's a good time to uh, take a break. Uh, if there's uh, no further questions right now. The second panel is uh, going to be a powerhouse with uh, Dave and Scott uh, talking about uh, both bricks and a history of development in BC as well. Sorry, is there a question? I was just going to say goodbye, Matt. Oh, I'm still there. Thank you, Matthew. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Okay. Okay. trillions and trillions of dollars of paper, which lost all of its value. Today's hyperinflation is global. It's much bigger, and as they say, the higher you are, the harder you fall. We've got seven billion people. At the time, it was isolated into Germany, into a certain geographical region. Um, but the principle of its uh, avoidance is the same. Now, today's uh, situation looks a little bit more like the second graph. Uh, Robbie, if you can go to the second image. Okay, this is an image, no, back up one, yep. So today's hyperinflationary bubble, of which the Canadian economy is locked into, and make no mistake about it, our banking system, as I will show in a few graphs later on, is highly integrated in this global bubble. Um, this is ready to blow. This is, everything that you see in red represents the growth of something which didn't even exist before the 1980s called derivatives. Now, I don't have enough time to go into really what that is. A lot's been written on this. But effectively, what we're dealing with are fictitious speculative capital based on different types. And there's rigorous, rigorous of mind and moral. Um, we can understand how to stop this hyperinflationary bubble from, from blowing up. And for anybody who doesn't know what hyperinflation is, uh, Robbie, the next picture uh, gets across an image from Germany in 1923 when you had a certain uh, process which ripped across the German, uh, at the time it was a republic, based upon the belief that the Versailles debt trees were somehow payable by an act of money printing. Now, this is the only comparable uh, process in modern times to what we face today, in the sense that we are facing a similar type of insanity, the idea that debt because it is debt, must be paid, even if it means just printing money uh, and shutting down costly social processes like hospitals and other, other forms of infrastructure. Uh, this insanity, which led to the, the destruction of the German uh, Reichsmark, which you see being burnt there in a fire, because really, it, it, that was what the you know, German currency's value was, was kindling. It was worth more than wood, because wood was part Um, 
they're all in the back there. I encourage you to, to have a look and uh, purchase them if you can. Um, so Matt's going to uh, give us a discussion now. Has made the point over decades on record that this could be understood. This is something which doesn't have to catch anybody off guard as a surprise. This is something which was foreseeable, which our movement has been created by Mr. LaRouche 40 plus years ago to stop from happening based on the fact that there are certain principled variables shaping uh, social processes in the universe that are not purely mathematical, statistical, or monetary. The fact that most economists who try to predict the future and fail and act every time as if it's a surprise that there's another economic crisis, fail because they are not taking into consideration those basic principles of reality, which Paul uh, illustrated that were more understood before the Bretton Woods system was, uh, or the, the fixed exchange rate system of the Bretton Woods was floated in 1971. In saner periods in Canada, the United States, and the Western world, and the world at large, we had a better sense of this. Now that's, that's generally gone. So, by getting across, um, what, well, basically by getting across the fact that everybody has the ability to know the future and to change it by being on. Um, how about you tell? How about you tell the audience what you're going to talk about? Okay. Well, uh, thank you for inviting me to give a, a summary report um, at your conference, Robbie. Um, so. Um, what I want to get across with this cartoon that I just began with that says stop, stop the Wall Street Euro time bomb with the global glass eagle um, is important because this, this image really does illustrate the, the essence of the battle, that we don't have an economy right now. What people think of as an economy of a euro, of uh, a dollar, is actually more uh, to be compared with a bomb. And when you look at what's holding this thing together and the global speculative markets, what is sustaining and keeping some seeming stability in the system is really a mountain of unpayable debts, which at this point is ripe uh, to default, to go bust, and take this pyramid scheme down with it. So we're sitting on a bubble. It's a bubble that, by its nature, will pop. And LaRouche, um, the American economist whom we, who we work with, 